Our topic today is vegan diet and oxidative and dicarbonyl stress. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. <laughs> what is oxidative stress? It's actually a part of our everyday life. We start with a beautiful with a beautiful apple and over the course of time uh, the apple is not looking as beautiful and uh, you know if you leave it there for a, for a little while all of a sudden you come back and it looks like this <laughs> and the same is happening in each of our cells in the body uh, a normal cell uh, when it's exposed to free radicals and oxidative stress uh, will look like this and eventually it will be filled with oxidative stress and it, it will be damaged. Uh, we know that a healthy atom looks like this, uh, but a free radical is missing an electron, which makes it much more reactive. Uh, it wants to be attached to your molecules in the body and change them structurally. Uh, and since we know that the level of oxidative and dicarbonyl stress is much higher in people with diabetes, uh, the question is why? It turns out that it's due to the high levels of uh, plasma glucose, not only in the fasting state, but also after a meal. Uh, those are much higher in people with type two diabetes than in healthy people. And the same is true for triglycerides. And both plasma glucose and triglycerides are the sources of dicarbonyls, uh, which are compounds that contain two CO groups. And uh, what are they doing in our body? Uh, the thing is, they increase oxidative stress, they also increase the formation of advanced glycation end products, uh, which are proteins that have been structurally changed because of their contact with, uh, with blood sugar or um, with dicarbonyls directly. Uh, a simple example is uh, glycated hemoglobin, uh, the A1C. Uh, you may, you, may have looked at your labs and probably you saw A1C. That's a marker whether, um, that will help you uh, decide whether you have diabetes or prediabetes or not. And it reflects the blood sugar control over the last three months. Uh, and it's, it's because the hemo hemoglobin in your red blood cells is exposed to these dicarbonyls um, from, uh, from all the nutrients and also oxidative stress. And these free radicals will um, just react with a certain portion of your hemoglobin. And this is the uh, A1C, uh, glycated hemoglobin. Uh, the dicarbonyls also decrease antioxidants in the body. They, they increase inflammation and they have been associated with the development of diabetic complications. Now, when we look at healthy aging, uh, the dicarbonyl levels in the body are low. Unfortunately, all the chronic diseases such as obesity and diabetes and heart disease and neurodegeneration, uh, all of them uh, have high level of dicarbonyls in the body. So what we wanna do is keep our dicarbonyls as low as possible for healthy aging. And now in an ideal scenario, the free radical formation is just counterbalanced by the antioxidants that we have in the body that we consume through the diet from, uh, from different plants, um, but that we also produce. Uh, unfortunately, in type 2 diabetes, uh, this balance um, is not working anymore, and the free radical formation just outweighs the antioxidants, which leads to oxidative damage. The oxidative stress has been directly linked to insulin resistance, um, the beta cell failure, uh, the failure of the beta cells in the pancreas to produce sufficient insulin 
to keep up with the body's demands and with the development of diabetic complications. Now, the question is, with so many antioxidants in plants, what, what if we switch to a plant-based diet? Would that be a magic uh, for oxidative stress in people with type 2 diabetes? Uh, to answer that question, we invited 74 people with type 2 diabetes to participate in a study. It was a randomized clinical trial, which means that half of the participants were um, randomized to follow a plant-based diet and the other half to follow um, a portion controlled ADA um, recommended diet. And the study lasted six months. Now we were measuring the oxidative stress markers in these patients with type two diabetes. And most probably you will not be surprised that vitamin C levels were much higher on a plant-based diet than on the control diet because they were eating more, many more plants that contain vitamin C. Uh, but what was really striking about these findings was the striking difference between the groups um, in the superoxidismatase and reduced glutathione levels, both of which were much higher on a plant-based diet than uh, in the control group. And both superoxidismatase and reduced glutathione are wonderful enzy enzymes and antioxidants. They are produced in our body so that the body can cope better with, with, the, with the oxidative stress. So in other words, uh, the plant-based diet really worked as a magic for, for oxidative stress. It helped to establish the balance between the free radicals and the antioxidants. So knowing that a plant-based diet can work in the long term uh, to boost the body's ability uh, to produce antioxidants, um, we were thinking, you know, when you look at the increase in uh, plasma glucose and in triglycerides in people with type 2 diabetes after the meal, uh, you can see that we performed um, standardized meal tests that lasted three hours. So you can see the difference in the fasting state, uh, like immediately, uh, the fasting blood sugar uh, was almost twice as high in people with type two diabetes uh, on average compared to healthy controls. And the same is true for triglycerides. But when you look at the postprandial levels, those also are almost twice, twice higher in people with type 2 diabetes than in healthy controls. So all of these are conditions that just increase the dicarbonyl and oxidative stress. And we were asking the question, you know, if we consume, let's say, a vegan meal compared with a standard sandwich, would that make any difference, like immediately after the meal? Or do we need to wait for a few months until we get the benefits from a plant-based diet? Which one is it? Well, in order to answer that question, uh, we performed another, uh, an un another randomized clinical trial that, that has been published in Nutrition and Metabolism. And for this trial, we enrolled 20, 20 patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, 20 uh, men, uh, all of the, the participants were male. Uh, so 20 men with type 2 diabetes, uh, 20 overweight men uh, with a body mass index and age matched to the um, type 2 diabetes group, and 20 healthy control that were age matched, but that were lean. So they were not body mass index matched. And uh, to all, all the participants, uh, we, we were giving two different meals in a random order. One was a vegan sandwich, and the other one was a traditional um, sandwich from McDonald's. Both of the meals had the same amount of calories, and they also had the same macronutrient content, so the same break breakout of uh, breakdown of protein and carbohydrate and fat. 
Now, before we start comparing the meals, let's just look at the uh, at these participants according to the study groups. So we can see that methylglyoxal, which is one of the dicarbonyls, the levels of methyl glyoxyl were much higher in people with type 2 diabetes compared to obese and compared to controls, uh, which is obviously in line. We, we know that that's the case. Uh, so, but I just wanted to show you uh, that these are the findings from our study. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the levels of vitamin C of ascorbic acid were lower in, in, in men with type 2 diabetes compared with uh, the, the, the control group. Uh, the difference between uh, men with dia diabetes and obese men uh, was not that significant. However, you can see that being healthy is always better than being overweight or have diabetes. Now let's dive into the difference between the meals. So when these men consumed the vegan meal and the, the standard sandwich, what, what kind of difference did it make? So let's start with men with type two diabetes. Uh, the, these men with type two diabetes had, had a lower um, oxidized glutathione levels after the vegan sandwich. Uh, which is a great finding because you want to have your oxidized glutathione high and your oxidized glutathione low. So this is a great finding for uh, their ability to cope with oxidative stress. And glutathione peroxidase was higher after the vegan meal, which is also uh, a very good finding. So uh, generally speaking, the vegan meal improved the oxidative stress in, in people with type 2 diabetes. Now let's switch over to the uh, overweight and obese individuals. So these obese men uh, experienced um, an increase in reduced glutathione, uh, which is a great finding. We want to keep it high after the vegan meal. And they also they also had a lower level of methyl glyoxyl, the, uh, the dicarbonyl that's dangerous and that's also related to the development of all the chronic diseases that we were talking about, heart disease and neurodegeneration and obesity and diabetes, all of that. So uh, the levels of methyl glyoxyl were lower after the, the vegan meal in, in this particular group. So the, the vegan meal worked well. Even just one single meal was able to reduce oxidative and dicarbonyl stress in these men with type 2 diabetes and uh, in these obese men. So all these are the chronic conditions that have been accumulated over decades of life. And our question was, how, how long does it take to improve this condition? And the answer, you're only one meal away from your improvement. <laughs> the next time you eat, what you eat has significant impact on the level of your uh, oxidative and dicarbonyl stress and in your body's ability to cope with them. You know, with, with sort of the growing... Uh, development in the food industry with plant-based um, meat alternatives and alternative foods. Uh, based on these findings and uh, research that you've you've seen um, through your time um, in in academia, uh, do you believe that processing makes a difference? Like for example, with a vegan or plant-based meal, a lot of the um, you know components uh, such as the polyphenols or the other nutraceuticals in those foods are sort of phase two antioxidant enzyme defense inducers. So, you know, if we strip the, if we strip the plant-based foods of those and try to make them tastier, I suppose, um, do you believe that that has a contribution to changing how that would affect um, the plant-based diet? That's a great question. 
uh, processing has been uh, shown to in increase uh, the content of the advanced glycation end products. So the answer is yes. At the same time, the origin of the foods plays a bigger role than the processing part. So yeah. the plant foods are generally speaking lower in the advanced glycation end products compared with animal products. So mm. let's say you have two choices. Which one would you like to eat? Would you like to have French fries or would you like to have uh, like baked meat um, or, or even cooked meat? Uh, cooked meat would be lower in advanced glycation end products uh, than fried meat. But still, the amount of uh, advanced glycation end products will be higher than even in French fries, you know, and obviously, uh, this is not a healthy food that we would recommend. Uh, the amount of uh, advanced glycation end products in French fries will be higher than in uh, in boiled potatoes, uh, but this is just to uh, just another co consideration. The origin of the foods um, plays an, a super important role too. That's fantastic. Thank you. And can you maybe tell us also a little bit more about your current research? Uh, I'm director of clinical research at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that provides nutrition education and research. And we are conducting many clinical trials on the role of nutrition in chronic diseases. So we conducted a few trials on the role of plant-based diet for diabetes, for weight control. Uh, we are just uh, running a study uh, for women with hot flashes. Uh, and, uh, ex you know, excitingly, uh, we are starting a second replication of a study for people with type 1 diabetes uh, and the role of a plant based diet in type 1 diabetes. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the benefits of a plant based diet for type 2 diabetes for a while, but now type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Uh, there's a lack of insulin. So these people need to inject insulin for the rest of their life. Uh, but similarly to type two diabetes, there are two components uh, to type one diabetes. And it's uh, the insulin secretion and the beta cell failure, uh, the failure of the beta cells in the pancreas to produce enough insulin, but also insulin resistance. So um, we are hoping uh, to just influence the insulin resistance part in, in these patients with type, in type 1 diabetes using a plant-based diet. We're comparing two active diets, um, a low-fat vegan diet and a portion-controlled carbohydrate count, counting uh, diet, which is like a traditional, um, a traditional approach. And so it's a randomized clinical trial. And if someone wants to participate, uh, they should definitely look, look it up on our website. Maybe, maybe we can even post a link uh, underneath uh, this particular video. Dr. Kaleova, many thanks for your time and for sharing this with us. Um, and uh, we, we wish you and your colleagues at your institute all the best and um, hope to see you again in the future. Yeah, Thank my you. pleasure, Alistair. Thank you for your work. And just tell me, where are you based? Uh, in Basel, you? in Basel, okay. in Switzerland. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Keep Thank up the good work. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.